In today's video, we're going to begin our discussion of AC, or alternating current. I think it's important to begin by distinguishing between AC and DC. So far in this course, we've only been dealing with DC, or direct current. In DC, things are either constant or transient. What these two things mean is that for a DC voltage source, for example, if I were to put my probes from, say, a digital multimeter or an oscilloscope across the two terminals, and it's a 10 volt source, I'm going to see 10 volts no matter what. For all time, my voltage source is, say, 10 volts. Now we have seen in the previous unit that there can be non-constant things going on in the circuit elements. For example, if I have a transient effect, where this might be governed by an exponential, and it might describe the voltage through a capacitor. However, one of the key things we need to realize about DC is that eventually things settle down. Eventually, if we allow that current to continue for as long as we want it to, it'll look constant. In AC, that is not true. In this course, we're going to assume that our waveforms are periodic. Basically, it means that the waveform will repeat. A very common one would be a sine wave. But that's not the only way for me to make a waveform that repeats. For example, we've seen things like a triangle wave in the lab. You might also see a square wave. All of these are examples of repeating waveforms, and all of them are something we might call AC, or alternating current. You can see that if this is, why don't we even call it a current, because we can have current or voltage, and it alternates between positive and negative, hence alternating current. In this unit, by far it's more common to talk about sinusoids and cosines. We'll talk a little bit about other types of waveforms, but for the most part we're going to be focusing on sine waves and cosine waves. This isn't done because it makes the math easy. It's actually done because sine waves and cosine waves are extremely important ways of producing electricity. If you go to any wall outlet and you have an oscilloscope with you, and you're very careful, and you plug your oscilloscope's probe into the wall outlet, you will see a sinusoidal output coming from your wall outlet. The reason is because of how generators are built. When I build a generator, there's a coil of wire and inside that coil is a magnet. Remember, magnets have north and south poles, and I'm representing that using shading or no shading. The magnet will spin. The electrons in the wire are also magnetic, and they get pulled back and forth depending on whether the north pole or the south pole of the magnet is passing near them. Because the magnet is moving in a circle, if you were to plot the current, which is just the moving electrons, as they move forward and backwards, you end up with a sine wave. For that reason, and because the vast majority of our power is generated using, well, these generators, sine waves are something that we study in extreme detail because they're very important for our understanding of how our circuits are going to work when we plug them into the wall. <coughs> Now, before we talk anything about how we can analyze sinusoidal inputs, we need to know what happens as a sinusoidal input is given to a circuit. We're going to look at two different circuits. One of them will be a simple voltage divider using only resistors. The other one will be a capacitive circuit.
Normally, we represent a DC voltage source with a plus and a minus. An AC voltage source, especially for using a sine wave, is typically given like this. Also, to indicate as a voltage source, we might put a plus and a minus there. Don't confuse that with understanding this is the positive terminal. Remember, AC goes up and down about zero. Instead, the way we should look at it is to understand that this, <coughs> excuse me, plus and minus indicate that we're looking at a voltage source, not a current source. We then need to give an expression for what that voltage source is. Sine waves have three possible things that we can look at. The amplitude, the frequency, which is properly given in radians per second, and something else I'm not showing here, which is the phase. In this case, our phase is zero degrees. We're going to be talking a lot more about phase later. But for now, just remember that there's something called a phase that we need to be considering. Otherwise, we can just attach it into our circuit like we normally would. And let's say this is a resistor R1, that's a resistor R2, and we're curious about this voltage here V. Well, this is still a voltage divider. Resistors don't really have any special properties with regards to how the signal is changing. And so we can treat this output voltage just like we would be treating a regular voltage divider. As a result, the voltage is going to be R2 over R1 plus R2 times the input voltage. The current through this resistor is going to be V over R, in this case R2, so we get 1 over R1 plus R2 times our voltage. What's important to understand here is what's being changed. The input is coming in with an amplitude A, a frequency omega, and a phase of zero. The output voltage has a scaled amplitude, R2 over R1 plus R2. The frequency is the same, and the phase in this particular case has not changed. The current waveform similarly, we have a scaled amplitude, same frequency, and same phase. We might make a general claim. If we have only resistors, this is important. Only resistors. We cannot make this claim when we have a capacitor or an inductor. Amplitudes will change. Frequency and phase, typically given by the Greek letter phi, do not. This is true for the voltage and the current waveform. Excuse me. But now, let's take a look at what happens when we have an energy storage element. So once again, I'm going to give myself an input of A sine omega t. And all I'm going to do is pass that through a capacitor C. Our capacitor has voltage Vc. In this case, because everything is in parallel, Vc is the same. However, the current waveform is different. If I now take the derivative of my input, what I'll get for the current is C A omega cosine of omega t. Usually when we're dealing with AC circuits, we don't want to deal with cosines in one place and sines in another. Since I started with a sine wave, I'm going to continue with a sine wave. So what we get is C A omega sine of omega t 
plus 90 degrees. So now let's take a look at what has changed. In the current waveform, we have an amplitude change. Also, we have a phase change. However, we do not have a frequency change. We can make a very similar argument for inductors. A key takeaway. When we have energy storage elements, that's capacitors and inductors, then we will have amplitude changes, we will have phase changes, both of these will change, but we will never have a frequency change. It's briefly important to notice that there are certain elements that we don't study in this course that can change frequency. We're not going to be looking at those elements. As a result, because we're only dealing with things like sources, resistors, capacitors, and inductors, these rules are going to hold. So, as we dive deeper into this, we're going to notice that if we have an amplitude and a phase change, it would be nice if we had a way to represent magnitude or amplitude and phase changes. We'll see later that complex numbers are a way to represent magnitude and phase that changes. They're actually extremely useful in the analysis of circuits that have AC voltages. In the next video, we're going to talk a little bit about why that is. We're also going to address a very important point. Complex numbers are typically made up of something called a real part and unfortunately something called an imaginary part. I'd like you to move away from that type of thinking. It's not an imaginary number. It does represent something important. Specifically, it allows us to represent a phase. If you in your head shift away from the concept of imaginary as being not real, then we're going to see how complex numbers are going to be astonishingly useful for the analysis of AC circuits. That will be in the next video.